Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the online show where we dive into the insights of municipal political leaders from across Canada. Now, our mission on this show is quite simple. Shine a light on the dedicated individuals who day in and day out work around the council table to shape the communities that we call home. Joining us for today's episode is from the town of Stony Plain, Alberta, Mayor William Choi. Situated along the Trans-Canada Highway, Stony Plain is part of a major transportation corridor called Port Alberta, which offers international market access by air, rail, road, and yes, even pipeline. A warm and welcoming community awaits you in Stony Plain. Their growth has been carefully nurtured, and the community provides residents and visitors alike with a hard-to-come-by balance of small-town charm and urban luxury. From the smallest village to the largest city across every region of the province, Alberta Municipalities represents the communities where over 85% of Albertans live. AB Munis provides a united voice for 265 of Alberta's 330 municipalities, including summer villages, villages, towns, cities, and specialized municipalities. As Alberta's largest municipal group, AB Munis listens to municipal leaders and advocates for solutions to their common issues. Additionally, AB Munis supports local governments by providing services specially designed to meet their operational needs. And they bring their members together regularly so they can share ideas and information so that their communities can thrive. Check out Alberta Municipalities at abmunis.ca and follow them on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, now called X. Mayor, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for sitting down and talking to me about yourself and about the great town of Stony Plain. But I want to start by getting to know the man behind the persona a little bit. And I've got to ask the question I've asked every single person who's ever come on the show, so you're no exception. Where does your sense of duty to serve your community come from, William? It came from uh, my childhood. Um, as many of um, my residents of Stony Plain know, uh, I immigrated to Stony Plain in 1980. Uh, my grandfather had a restaurant here called Bing's Restaurant. And so my parents worked at it uh, for many years until they took over and, and purchased it from him. And as a uh, six-year-old uh, boy uh, coming to me that I don't speak a language, uh, it was very, very difficult to kind of get uh, kind of uh, into the groove right away. However, I noticed over the, the years, uh, the residents were very, very supportful of, uh, of my parents and my grandparents. Uh, many times at the restaurant, uh, the customers are teaching my parents uh, how to read and write and what certain things are. And same thing with us as well. Um, a lot of them took us under our wings, especially um, my parents were working. Uh, had a few friends through school and I went to their houses and, you know, the community kind of helped uh, raise us to where we are now. And I uh, just definitely always wanted to give back. And when the opportunity uh, came forward to, for me to run for council back in 2007, uh, I took that opportunity to make sure I was uh, there to give back and say thank you to the community that has uh, helped us raise, raise us to this point. Was mom and dad political or were they so far out of the political realm that you're kind of the quote unquote black sheep of the family who was interested in politics at a young age? Uh, they didn't understand what political was or even the word. Uh, they're so busy, uh, you know, just kind of starting to build a life. You know, coming from China with very, very low means and working long hours at the restaurant, uh, they didn't have a chance and opportunity to get involved in the community. Uh, so they did what they could in terms of donating to uh, community groups, and user groups and sports groups that were having fundraisers. But outside of that, uh, you know, they didn't get involved very much. So what was happening in 20, 2007, what made you decide, OK, now is the time to put my name on the ballot? Was it encouragement from the community or was there an issue going on in the community that you said, OK, I think my voice would be perfect around the council table? It was something that I wanted to, uh, to do uh, when I was in high school, just giving back to the community. Uh, but at that time, I was already involved in the uh, Rotary Club of Stony Plains, so definitely a lot of volunteer work and trying to get involved in the community a little more. And uh, I've... Uh, actually taken over the restaurant from my, my parents as well kind of purchased the majority share there because uh, i graduated with a bachelor of arts and also a teaching degree which at that point in time there was not a lot of teaching jobs uh, so i decided to come back to family business um, and then you know as a uh, you know small entrepreneur um, everybody i talked to that came in the restaurant had issues complaints and talked about things and i was kind of sharing you know this is what i think should be done and a lot of uh, you know residents said you know, you have a good head in your shoulders, why don't you run? So 
you know what? That's the thing I've been thinking about anyway. So let's uh, let's make an effort and give it a shot. Was it always municipal for you? Was there ever a decision that you'd say maybe provincial or because your background might have gone well with provincial or was it always municipal, municipal, municipal to give back to the community that you called home? Yeah, it's always been municipal. It's about giving back to the community, uh, you know, from my time now from, since 2007 uh, till now, I've had a few opportunities to kind of maybe go up provincially, but I see uh, what's happening provincially and federally. And I just like, you know, that's not where my heart is. Um, when I can't sit there and voice what I can feel and, and feel what's best for my community, uh, it just doesn't jive well with uh, who I am. So elected in 2007, re-elected in 2010, by-election in 2012, where you're uh, become mayor, acclaimed in 2013 as mayor, elected in 2017, elected in 2021. You have seen Stony Plain change dramatically. And I say that because I was looking at the stats. In When you were first elected, the population was about 12,000 and change. According to the latest census in 2023, 20, 20, uh, 20, you're about 19,000. So you've grown substantially 7 grand 7,000 over the last roughly I'd say 7 years. How much yeah. has Tony Plain changed for you from your perspective as a municipal leader from 2007 to where we are today in September 2024? Yeah, it's like you know as you mentioned by the numbers we've grown huge right in terms of what we're doing and providing those services for community. Uh just to add to that, uh, when I came to Sony Plain, there was less than 3,000 people in 1980. So I've seen a huge growth, you know, from my, my upbringings going to uh, Stony Plain Elementary School, Stony Plain Junior High, and then also then the Stony Plain Memorial Composite High. And just to be able to see the changes now in terms of like we're looking at our first rec center, indoor rec center that we've been building since 1967. All right, so that's a huge impact to our community. Uh, looking at the uh, first uh, municipal cemetery, um, you know, town or size does not have a municipal cemetery, a public one anyways. Hmm. Right? We're also looking at uh, more highway development on 16A and Highway 628. So those are the things that we're kind of laying the foundations for, for our future growth. And it's, it's great um, from 2007 till now, I think one of the biggest things that I kind of um, share with uh, with council and our men and our, and our residents is that, you know, if you as Ms. Pauly are not willing to invest in yourself, who will invest in you? Right, so I think that was a big, big shift. Did that come with the challenge, though? Because after so many years in municipal politics, you've probably come to the realization that every decision you make is not going to be a hundred percent supported by your community. There's always going to be naysayers, and I every community has that. Your Stony Plain's not this, uh, any different. How do you, as mayor, and even as when you were councillor, make those tough decisions for the best of the community, knowing that people may be upset with the decisions you make? Yeah, that's it's always fine line that you'll say that, you know, whatever decision you make, there's always a group of people that are not happy with it. But definitely with for myself and members of council is that make sure that we have the proper planning in place. So we take the time to kind of uh, have those conversations uh, at the local grocery store, restaurants, uh, at our definitely many uh, events within the town, such as like some like summer sessions, um, you know, farmers days. Those are the community events that we connect with our residents and we kind of engage them. So, okay, this is what we're looking forward to next. Okay, so when we look at terms of, um, for example, rec center, that thing we started talking about since 2007 when I first got an election in the council. We did a couple of studies with our partners with Spruce Grove and Parkland County, kind of revisited it again and make sure that, you know, the residents understood why we needed to do it at the cost that's associated with it and how it's going to benefit Sony Plain. So you're not going to get everybody on board, but you're going to get the majority of the people say, we understand why this project is happening. We understand why we have to increase taxes to pay for it. And we can see the benefits when it's complete. You get a sense that there's engagement within your community because I was just recently up in Stony Plain uh, about a week and a half ago uh, as of this airing. And I, 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 I'm one of those random people who likes to talk to people at, like, at coffee shops and ask them questions. And people seemed like they were engaged. They were willing to answer some of the questions that I had. But from a mayor's perspective, do you feel like the people are tuned in on what's actually happening at council? So when you have to go ask them these questions about even the rec center or raising taxes or what's going on in the budget, people are willing to give their feedback to you? 
Yeah, for sure. I think our, our staff do a great job in terms of communication and just um, kind of uh, putting the information out there and then doing surveys, then to make sure that we take the time to set up um, kind of meet and greets and stuff when we need to actually consult uh, the residents. Uh, like right now, uh, the best kind of example is that's recent is uh, we're looking at doing, we're doing Old Town South. So Old Town South is the area, you know, close to uh, where the new Westview School is and also that's close to where we're, we're doing phase one of the recreational center. And that's also my Old Stone Plain Elementary School, Old Stone Plain Junior High, and Old Stone High School, right? So as those things kind of, um, you know, fade to the background and they get kind of demolished and then now we have vacant land. So we've been doing surveys of like, hey, what do you see about Old Town stuff? Like, what do you reimagine? So we did that. And then as we come around to next year, we're re-engaging our residents again with the pop-ups and just conversations is okay. We have this much land here. We'll definitely need some for residents. You know, do you see any commercial in that area? Do you see this, right? So it's kind of, you know, continue that conversation and again and again. So that when we do uh, kind of pull the trigger on something, uh, council feels, you know, secure in what we're doing and that we've taken an opportunity to engage and talk to residents. We know there's always going to be those people that say, don't do anything. I like the green grass. I like this large area. And there's people like, yeah, you know, go ahead. That makes sense. So it's always a balance to say, this is the reason why we're doing it. And this is for our future going forward as a community. Do you think you've struck in the, uh, an, an appropriate balance of the growth, sustainable growth, along with keeping that small town charm? Because as, as I said, I was there and I asked some questions and people said, I love the small town feel of our community. I love that we everyone knows each other, even though we're a population of about, they said about 17,000. I realize now it's 19,000. So people understand that they like that small town feel where everyone looks out for each other and you as council see the growth happening and you are dictating where the growth is happening. So do you feel like you've stricken the right balance of keeping that small town charm with that growth that is coming? Yes, I think, uh, you know, council and administration have done a great job over the last, you know, 15, 20 years to make sure that we may maintain that. I think growth is going to happen regardless if, if you do anything or not, right? It's, it's how you grow. And council has been very, very focused on making sure that uh, as we grow, we don't lose that identity of who we are. Uh, that's why we have a lot of pop public arts. Uh, we also have a lot of um, kind of murals, in the, you know, you're in the community that depict our history. Because I think if you forget where you come from, you lose sight of where you're going. And, you, you, and, go ahead. Yeah. And I've like you know, talked to many of our residents that, uh, like I said, that have seen the growth. And some people do not like that because they think we're going to lose that small town feel. And then my comment to them, it was like, you know what? You don't have to worry because this council and then hopefully in the next council, council that do come forward is that feeling is created by the council and the administration from the top down. Right. If you have a council that is kind of stand off thinking that they're one better than the average resident, then that's when you start losing that small town feel. And uh, so how do you, how do you ensure that happens? Engaged. I apologize, I apologize to interrupt, but how do you ensure that happens? Because you're elected and I looked at the election results. The only time that you were acclaimed was in 2013 when you ran for re-election after the by-election. How do you ensure, and I say this is just pointed at directly at you here, William, how do you ensure that everyone feels like their voice is being heard by you? Because you have to represent everyone, even the people who didn't vote for you at the council table. And that means that you're going to have to sit there and listen to people who disagree with your opinion. How how important is it for you to listen to all sides, even those who disagree with you? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, like very important to me because uh, I do represent uh, Stony Plain as a whole. So I take the opportunities at the many of our events to talk to anybody that's willing to talk to me. I also engage them on social media. So through my social media channels as well, I got a lot of messaging that comes through. Um, actually, I'm surprised when I talk to a lot of people and it's like, you actually answer me? It's like, yeah, that's it's me. And it's not it's not staff. I don't have staff that, that answer the questions that come through on an email or Facebook or anything like that. It's just me. So when the residents have questions, issues, and they want to share their thoughts, it's coming directly to me. So I'm able to take all that in and then I bring that to the council table when we talk about things. Um, like I said, we're not gonna get everything right for everybody. I think we govern for the majority of the people. And uh, but I want to make sure that every resident feels that they've been heard. 
how do you balance the role of a, a, and I don't say small town because you're really not a small town anymore, but how do you balance the life of a mayor in your community with personal life? Because when you leave your door at your house, you are the mayor of your community. That means when you go to the grocery store, you're going to be stopped and you're going to be asked questions. Or when you go to the restaurant with your family, you're going to be stopped and asked questions. Have you found a, a, an appropriate balance? Because we're going into an election year here and there's going to be people listening to this saying, I may want to put my name on the ballot, but I do not want the 24 hour a day, seven day a week job that consists of being a counselor or a mayor if it means that I don't have a personal life anymore. How have you been able to balance the two responsibilities of being mayor and just being William? Yeah. It's getting a little bit easier now as, as I get a little more wiser in my, uh, in my age. Yeah, it's just make sure that I acknowledge that, that they're there. I talk to them for a couple of minutes. And then if I can sense it's going to be a long conversation, it's like, you know what? I'm out with my family We're doing this. Here's my number. Please give me a call and we'll connect, set us up and we'll have a coffee together half an hour, 45 minutes, whatever is needed to have that conversation. But it's to make sure that they're, they, they're knowledge and then set up a follow-up meeting. So my last question before we turn to the town of Stony Plain as a whole is about the jurisdictional responsibility that the municipality play. You and I probably know this quite well, that the municipality has a role to play, but I would hazard a guess, and I'm painting a broad stroke here, and I hate to do that, but the average resident probably does not come to you just with municipal issues. They probably come to you with provincial issues or even federal issues from time to time. Now, they've come to you because they probably know you better than they know their MLA or their MP. Have you seen a blurring of that jurisdictional role and responsibility and the uh, acknowledgement of what roles the, the, the town plays compared to the province of the federal government with your residences? Yes, for sure. Definitely. As you mentioned, the residents don't really know whose jurisdiction it is. And they'll definitely come to the municipal elected official because we see them and interact, interact them in you know, weekly or even biweekly basis, whereas they might see the MLA once every quarter, once every year. But uh, it is very, you know, it's not, it's a fine balance. The balance is that, uh, that we know what the issues are. And we, within the town's and plan, we have an advocacy for those uh, issues. Uh, for example, uh, healthcare is not a jurisdiction of the municipal government. But we have an advocacy where we're working with the provincial government to uh, increase the services at the Westfield Health Center and also an expansion. So when residents has that conversation with me, it's like, yes, we understand that. We see what your needs are. We do not control that, but we do have an efficacy plan for that because we understand that is what we need in our community. When would you say that blurring started in your eyes? Was it, and I'm going to sort of throw it a big pandemic event here, but was it post-pandemic when you saw that true blurring of those jurisdictional lines because the municipalities were on the front lines and they were the ones dealing with the residents every day where the province and the federal government weren't really as seen in the municipalities as their mayors or councillors. Yeah, for sure. There's a little bit before that, but it definitely heightened during during that, that time. Um, There's a lot of, you know, uncertainty there. Um, sometimes the, the federal government will say, well, the municipalities, the municipalities can choose or the, the provincial governments can choose because they know the, their own kind of area. And then and the, the provincial government says, well, you know, we don't want to make the So the municipalities can do it. Then when the municipalities do it, the, the government goes, no, we want to do it because we understand that. I'm like, okay, well, I think a lot of blurring that happened more there is because of the uncertainty there and that uh, there was uh, maybe everybody's just afraid to make the wrong choice. So everybody's kind of tiptoeing, which then caused, uh, you know, blurred lines even more than they, they should have been. I agree wholeheartedly. I was working for a municipality then. And I, I just remember the headaches that as administration, we had to deal with it whenever there was a new policy or new announcement from the federal provincial government. That's Chris Brown saying that. That's not the mayor of Stony Plain saying that. Um, I want to just turn to the Sto uh, town of Stony Plain for a few minutes now. But before I uh, start this line of questioning, I'm going to preface it by saying this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council, not a policy of council, not even a direction of council. This is his opinion and his opinion alone. It may match up with what's going on at council but it's his opinion alone he is one vote on that council that being said mayor in your opinion what do you believe is the biggest issue or issues facing the town of stony plain as of recording this interview uh, i think with like many municipalities is uh, sustainable funding uh, as, as 
as you know, being in the business, um, as a population of just uh, roughly 19,000 people, it's very hard to uh, complete those infrastructure projects and build as many as that we need for residents uh, with only about eight cents on the, every tax dollar. So having that sustainable funding formula from the provincial government and federal government allows us to do more of the long-term um, planning, which then we can kind of uh, relate to our residents to ensure that, you know, we do have uh, our ducks lined up and roll and we know what we're doing. But when we can constantly have to wait year after year for funding, if it's going to be the same grant funding or it's not going to be funding, where they pulled the grant funding from that was there last year, it's very hard for us to be elected officials to provide that kind of consistency for residents. And given that trust to residents that, that they think that council knows what they're talking about, but we can't fund it. So I've had Minister McIver on the show and I've asked him sort of the question and he said that municipalities now have LGFF, which is the local government fiscal framework, which is a predictable funding model for municipalities to sort of ride through the funding announcements. Uh, this is in replacement of MSI. Did Sony Plain get what they were looking for or is it uh, not sufficient enough in your uh, opinion? And this, I know it's a political question, but I'm going to be chatting with the minister at Alberta municipalities here in, yep. well, by the time this airs this week. So do you think that there needs to be more done? Well, hundred percent, definitely. You know, we're looking at the kind of the formula stuff, but it's a good start. hundred percent with the uh, LGFF gives us some parameters to kind of, plan on. So going forward, as we do our capital planning for the next five to 10 years, we can, we can kind of have a base now, right? Which we probably didn't have before, because before that with MSI was like, well, hey, we had an extra billion dollars in, in the grant envelope. Oh, no, now we lost $5 million in that grant envelope. So it, it's hard to, to, to balance and kind of play that kind of uh, game where we're trying to, you know, what is a priority and what is not a priority. But uh, with the LGFF by the, the provincial government, it allows that a little more stability. And I like the way that that is kind of attached to kind of the province's prosperity. The better that the province does, the better that we do as, as community, communities. And I like the fact that there is a base so that we will never get any less than that. So that's how we can plan going forward. We, you talk about the infrastructure challenges that are coming with the sort of the lack of revenue coming in. Municipalities rely on two things, grants and property taxes. Those are the two sources of revenue that you get. Um, you were about to head into probably one of the toughest budget seasons that probably municipalities have faced in some time. The economy is bad, inflation is high, resources or the revenue isn't coming in as quickly as it used to. When you're looking at this budget, when you're looking at the infrastructure challenges that your town faces, do you feel like you're gonna be prepared or do you feel like you're gonna have to not go through with some of the infrastructure projects that you're looking at because you're just not going to have the revenue to address it. Yeah, definitely. We're, you know, as a council and administration, we've been planning for it for these days. So, uh, so we have a longer capital plans and stuff and they're on kind of on a sliding ruler. So a lot of some of the projects are like, okay, we will prove it based on this amount of uh, funding from us. And then the rest from grant funding. If we don't get that grant funding, then we continue to push it off because, um, you know, I'm not going to tax 19,000 people uh, to do a project where when the province can tax, you know, four and a half million people or, the, or, you know, or Canada can tax 44 million people. It's a lot more difficult for that. So those are the things that we've uh, talked about as a council and administration is to make sure that uh, we have those plans in place. And we we'll also have the ability to um, accelerate them when funding does come in or to pull them back when, it's, uh, when funding is not there. Do you feel like your Stony Plain is in a good position this year to ensure that because people are struggling and I'm assuming you hear this enough from your residents that when they go to the grocery store, they're, some are living paycheck to paycheck. And that means that the municipality plays a role in potentially making them go without food or go without that luxury that they're looking for. When you're going to go into this budget season, are you prepared to make the tough decisions to either cut or ask people to pay a little bit more? Yeah, for sure. We'll definitely look at um, every opportunity there is to uh, maintain taxes as low as that they can be uh, without sacrificing the services that our residents uh, require on. Um, I think a lot of the things that we've talked about as a council is like, you know, we need to make sure that we have those services those for those that need it right now. So we have to be careful of, of how much we cut back as well, because uh, some 
like a lot of those residents are relying on those services. And it's always easy just to take a pen and start, you know, taking numbers off and taking zeros off. But if those were the services that were, you know, viable or were dependent on, 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 on these services from your residents, if you don't have them there, well, you've just exacerbated the system and exacerbated the problem. So that's always a fine line. Uh, definitely, we uh, tend to focus a lot on our community and social development too. Uh, through the FSS, we always um, overfunded that because we knew um, a dollar of prevention, you know, is worth three dollars of cure. Uh, I 100% agree to that and, and believe that because the more that we can do up front, um, even though that may take five to ten years to see the kind of the fruits of your labor, sometimes it's worth to talk to a resident and say, you know, we need to increase this because we know ten years down the road we're gonna have a huge windfall that will help the residents and we need to support the residents that need it today and not say you're on your own. You talk about a very macro issue here, which is infrastructure and revenue. And that is a very macro issue in the grand scheme of things, because there's a lot of things under that umbrella. But as I said, I went to the Stony Plan and I talked to some people and infrastructure wasn't the top priority for them. It was safety. Yeah. It was social, social services. It was homelessness. And these are and there was the odd occasional person. And I remember the man quite well. He says, there's been a pothole in front of my house for the last week. And I don't know when this town's going to get to it, but it's there. And it's the biggest thing that is important to me. So those are the micro issues, but to them, they are very macro. How do you balance what the council needs to do and address with those micro issues, those macro issues to those residents that they see are the biggest issues to them, whether it be safety or even that pothole. How do you find that striking that coherent balance to ensure that when people pay their taxes, they're feeling like their taxes are going towards them? Yeah, hundred percent. And uh, we always hear that again, because um, personally myself, in front of my house, the water pools a lot <laughs> when, when it rains. So again, I have a conversation and our staff have seen it and looked at it and go, okay, so in terms of priority list, this is where it is. And then it may get done, it may not get done. And that's the same same way that we kind of address our residents in terms of their issues that they see each and every day. For them, it's a huge issue because they see it every day. And I, and I acknowledge that. But I said, okay, here's all the lists of the things that we've seen throughout the community that needs to be fixed or repaired. Here's a priority list that our staff have done. So it's outside of council's hands. So it's now our staff reviewing that and kind of prioritizing based on safety, you know, availability, and then the amount of budget that is set for them. And we tell them like, sometimes it might take a couple of years to get this addressed, but rest assured that is there is more uh, pressing issues and safety issues that are getting addressed first. And so uh, when they call our, our staff, it's easy to say, yeah, it's on the list. Uh, here it is. We're doing these projects first because that's the, the budget we have. And um, if nothing else new comes up, then we can see it get done the next year. But if something else happens, you know, potholes are famous, right? Every year there's new potholes that we've never seen before. And if it's, you know, more of a safety issue for this one than, than the one that was identified three years ago, well, that one might not get done. The more pressing one will get done first, right? I can imagine if I was in Stony Plain, say in November or December, when it was snowing, the snow removal would probably be the top priority for a lot of people's concerns. It all depends on the season, right? 100%. And I think, like as, as you mentioned, uh, we make sure that our residents know, or like say, we have a lot of plans in terms of pothole. We have uh, asphalt pavement, I'll call the index, so we've gone and tested all the rows. So we know what the call is and what kind of um, repair and maintenance that needs to be done, uh, when they need to be fully redone. And the same with, uh, you mentioned snow removal. Uh, we do have uh, two snow removal crews that go. We also have a kind of list of all the subdivisions. Right? And we rotate them every year by a third. So if you're in the top third this year, well, then next year you're at the the middle, the two thirds, and then next year you're at the bottom third, and then the fourth year you're back at the top. And sometimes when you're at the top, there's no snow, so you don't see, so you don't see that service level. <laughs> and then when it goes back down to the bottom third, it snows like crazy, and then I, then they complain like, but you were up there at the top two years ago. That's the great thing about municipalities; you can never please 100 percent of the people, like we said at the beginning of the interview. Um, I want to flip the script a little bit and I want to talk about the accomplishments of Stony Plain because we all have challenges and we all have things that are challenging for municipalities right now. In your opinion, 
what is the thing you are proud of when it comes to Stony Plain? When you go to Alberta municipalities or FCM or speak to other municipal leaders from across the province, what do you tell them about Stony Plain that you're doing right? Well, definitely, we're doing right with in terms of engagement and making sure that our residents feel heard and the ability to uh, work with our municipal neighbors. It's not very often do you have uh, the ability of a city, a county, and a town working together to kind of push the initiatives and the benefits of the region and not the individual municipality. I think that's one of the biggest key factors uh, living in this tri-region is that uh, we've got kind of more or less put our guard down and saying, you know what, sometimes it's okay not to have that amenity or that service in directly in our municipality. It's okay if it's five minutes away because we know the bigger picture is that that's going to still service the region. For us to compete directly, to have two services within, you know, 10 miles apart, that doesn't benefit anybody, but it increases their taxes for maybe even a less sufficient or efficient service. So how has your relationship changed over the last, uh, I want to say, 10 years since you were first elected as mayor with the uh, Parkland County and Spruce, the city of Spruce Grove? Because you guys are sort of a shining beacon of what collaboration can be. Whenever I see the three of you guys talking about what's going on in your community, it seems like it's a cohesive, coherent message that we're all in the same, we're all in this together. It's not Stony Plain versus Spruce Grove or Parkland. It's all three of us working together for a common goal of serving your community. Yeah, well, definitely. Can I we acknowledge that each municipality has the individual niches and needs and wants and stuff, but also realize the regional picture. So we will not stand in the way of anybody trying to, to achieve that. We also realize that uh, we're stronger together. So in terms of you know working together, a uh, perfect example is um, our indoor recreational study that we did way back in 2007. We updated it in 2017. Parkland County took the lead on that because they were doing that. Now we have Spruce Grove building a civic center which has uh, indoor ice services, etc. Well, our phase one does not have indoor ice. Right? We have a field house, double gymnasium, uh, curling rink, you know, exercise track. So we're kind of partnering those things together because we can we understand that those amenities can serve the region and not just the one municipality. But it'll be very, very um, kind of not very smart of us if we wanted to compete. You know, we wanted to build an ice surface as well. And that makes no sense, right? Especially since you're so close. Do you get, do you, I apologize to ask this sort of weird question during this yeah. part, but do you get a sense that when the province looks at the area, the tri-region, they look at you as a region and not as individual municipalities? Or are you better off when the province does look at you as that tri-region rather than an individual municipality? Because they're looking at that collaboration, collaborative work that you guys are doing. Yep, I think that it's uh, kind of beneficial to look at us as a region. Like I said, we have individual priorities and we will uh, address the province with those individual needs for our community. But it's always good because we usually tend to get letters of support from the other municipalities as well uh, to, you know, to take. So it gives us a little more clout. We also have, like work together in terms of advocacy. Uh, perfect example is Highway uh, 628. Um, there's a little bit that comes to Stony Plain that goes through Spruce Grove and Parkland County, but three of us have been advocating with the provincial government, which now we see it's going to get realigned, and and so there's dollars coming towards that. Uh, definitely easier when when we have three municipalities working together instead of fighting for those those tax dollars. Um, we we talked about the upcoming election, and this is a new line of questioning that I've introduced only for Alberta municipal leaders. But I've got to ask: uh, We are a year away from the next general election municipally in the province of Alberta. That means that there is going to be uh, people running for an election in Stony Plain. Will we see William's name back on the uh, uh, list of candidates, or have you made up your mind yet? Yep, I'm not too sure yet. I uh, haven't made up my mind. Uh, definitely, as uh, every election comes comes to, it's a conversation with my family uh, to see you know, what our goals are uh, and with, with you know the overall community. Um, as you mentioned uh, earlier, uh, it's really hard to take off your elected official hat, especially in a community of twenty thousand people. So that's something that we have to talk about as, as a family. And then uh, by closer down, maybe six months out or five months out, uh, you know, we'll make our final decisions at that time.
Awesome. Um, so I want to turn to my last segment. And it's my favorite segment because I like to learn about your municipality from you. But I like to learn about the hidden treasures in each municipality. As I said, I was just there, but I want to learn about what are the hidden treasures from a tourist perspective that you recommend to people when they come to Stony Plain? What are they for you? Yeah, well, definitely our, our Main Street. Uh, we kind of redid the Main Street a few years ago. Took a little bit of pain, but uh, it's beautiful now. Uh, lots of um, quaint little mom and pop stores. Uh, great for a little bit of dining as well and shopping. Uh, we have services down there as well. So you definitely spend a full day. If you're coming from the east side of, uh, of Edmonton and beyond, uh, it's definitely a great uh, vacation if you want to come out this way. We we'll also have uh, great community events as well. Uh, definitely if you plan to come. The third Thursday of June, July, and August are kind of hits. Uh, there are Midsummer Thursdays where we close down about uh, two blocks of Main Street, and we have vendors out, we have farmers. Uh, it's just a huge kind of uh, engagement with our community to say, you know, this is what a small town should be, right? That field doesn't matter how big we get, it's having those events so that we can pull our, our residents together. We bring our residents from the surrounding area as well to connect and say hi. Uh, that's how we maintain that uh, small town feel. So that's one of the hidden gems within Town Stone Plain is that we have a lot of uh, community events that uh, kind of uh, pull us together and, and keeps us rooted in that kind of uh, small town farming agriculture history. Is there a spot in the community that you can go to and just decompress after a long day of council meetings or a long day of interacting with residents? I know I'm asking the Sophie's Choice question here, but I've got to ask the Sophie's Choice question. What's the spot for you that you can just let it all go? Well, one of the places like I enjoy walking and, and doing a few things. Uh, one of my favorite spots is I like to walk uh, Rory Park. So it's just down uh, as you come into town off the overpass. Uh, it's nice and quiet. Uh, we just uh, kind of um, added the, the frisbee golf there as well. But for me, there is a Pokemon stop there that I like to, there's a little route that, uh, that I do. Uh, so sometimes when I blow off steam there, I, Turn on my Pokemon game, Pokemon Go. We started that way back with my kids, and then I, I stopped playing for a while. And then my nephew started playing, so I, I turned the game back on. It's like something just to kind of um, pass the time and not think about anything. About let's just take this route and walk around the figure eight around the ponds. Um, so we're going to be both in Red Deer. So when we're there, we need to exchange Pokemon trainer codes. So that way we can exchange gifts because that's why I go to all these municipalities is to go <laughs> learn about these Pokemon stops there. So <laughs> I will be looking for that route now. Well, actually, if, if, if um, you know, we've gone to a few different communities and you see different things. And uh, when you turn on your, your, your Pokemon game there, it highlights all the highlights in the community that you don't see on a map. Like, because there's churches, there's, uh, you know, statues, there's everything that the, the average person would not see if they're just driving down the road. Yep. Little monuments that are historical plaques. And you're like, well, I didn't, I would never have expected this, but that's why I loved it. That's why I love Stony Plain, because <laughs> I got a lot of, a lot of gifts there. Wow. This, there this went off. We'll have to exchange, exchange oh. code, uh, trainer to the codes. So I've got to ask one question before I ask the last question. So I was reading your bio on the Stony Plain website, and there's a fun fact there. And it says Mayor Choi can hit a golf ball a long way for someone his height. How far can you hit a golf ball? Uh, I don't know. A lot of times I'm in contention for the long drive. Okay. Okay. Good to know. So I want to turn to my last question. It's the million dollar question. So we started by talking about you. We'll end by talking about the Stony Plain and how great it is. In your opinion, Mayor, what makes the town of Stony Plain such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Definitely. You know, Stony Plain is very warm and welcoming and very accepting of uh, individuals that come to our community. Uh, we know that uh, Stony Plain is a place for everyone. So it doesn't matter your your color, your social economic standing, uh, where you are in terms of your your life journey, um, you are welcome in the Sony Plain. Awesome. Mayor, I want to thank you, William. Thank you so much for sitting down and doing this. This has been an honor and pleasure. And I always get something new out of these interviews. And you always, when you, whenever I find a Pokemon fan, I will always chat with them. So thank you so much <laughs> from the bottom of my heart for sitting down and chatting about Sony Plain and yourself today. Uh, good. Thank you very much for the, the time and definitely appreciate the being able to share about uh, my community.
Thank you for tuning in for another great episode of Cross Border Interviews. Now, we hope you've enjoyed today's conversation with one of Canada's municipal leaders making a true difference in their community. If you haven't already, be sure to head over to our YouTube channel and hit the subscribe button. Or if you're listening to this on audio platforms, hit the follow button today. So you never miss an upcoming episode with another great municipal leader. Your support helps us to continue to bring these great, important conversations to you. So stay connected, stay informed, and we'll see you next time here. Mm -hmm.